Hello and welcome to the Matt Lagore Show. I'm your host, Matt Lagore. Have you ever had this experience where someone comes up to you and they ask you the question, are you busy? Now, I get that question all the time with the line of work I'm in. When I go to see my customers, the first question they ask me, they go, are you busy? And I always go, yeah, I'm, I'm busy. And they go, well, that's good. And I realize that the question they're asking me is not, are you busy? Because who cares if someone else is busy? The question they're asking is, are you still playing this game? Because I just want to make sure you're playing too, because it's kind of crazy and it's hectic and I don't know if I should do it, but if you're doing it, I'll keep doing it. And I kind of had this realization, this revelation, when I was on vacation last week. I was up in Niagara Falls, and Niagara Falls, if you've ever been there, is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and mesmerizing. And I was down on the Maid of the Mist where they bring you down into the middle of the Horseshoe Falls, and you're just surrounded by this enormous amount of water and power and, and gigantism, I guess is the best word. And it's almost overwhelming at first, but something strange happens after about 30 seconds to a minute being in there. You get overcome with peace and tranquility, and it's beautiful, and it, and it, it, it entices these, these emotions in yourself and in other people. Everyone gets so happy, and they're hugging, and they're taking pictures, and it's great. It's beautiful, and the feeling is very peaceful. Then they turn the boat around, and they bring you back to shore, and they hustle you off the boat, they push you down the hallway, shove you on an elevator, and they shove you back out in the street so they can bring the next group in, and you walk away. And what I did is I walked about a half a mile away, and we walked up into the center of downtown Niagara, and I was surrounded, inundated by busyness and activity and eye candy. There was a Wrigley's Believe It or Not Museum, the Guinness Book of World Records, a haunted house, a wax museum, people talking, speakers, and I turned around and I looked back behind me and I could see Niagara Falls and this, this peacefulness back there. And here I am in the middle of this chaos. And I just said to myself, at what point did I agree to this? Did I say, okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this with my life. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't comprehend at what point in my life I said, okay, to this. So I've often, I kind of struggle with this a lot. And I talk to people about this because there is a sense of you do need to do things. You do have busyness in your life. But at what point is it overwhelming? So I've talked to some people and I've made some good friends in these conversations. And today on my show, I have my guest, Tom Asacker. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great Glad to, be to here. have you. Nice All to right. be here, Matt. And I know, Tom, you feel kind of the same way I do about some of this stuff. I, I think so, you know, and some of the conversations we had. And, you know, we've had good conversations. I had you on my radio show. Yeah. I've read your book, The Business of Belief, and you have a new book, I Am Keats, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so I always, often struggle with it. You know, I think I do pretty good with it, but what is your feeling on what I just said? Yeah, well, I think that uh, most people become hypnotized by their routines, by habit, by life. Um, and to your point about what you experienced when you left that, that calm environment and entered this new environment, right? Because it, Basically, that's what you did. You went from one environment to another. And your environment took control over your perceptions, mm -hmm. your feelings, your decisions. And I, I think a lot of people miss the fact that we are pretty much influenced by what our environment is. And when we put ourselves into the environment, that's a, that's a conscious choice. Yeah. We need to understand the conscious choices that we make in that environment. And if that environment overwhelms us, we need to move out of that environment or change something in that environment. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's like people who want to lose weight but keep the potato chips in the house. <laughs> they haven't modified the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And the environment is much more powerful than our little bit of conscious mind that we use. Yeah, and I think there's a, that, that's a good point is that it, we're in a situation that's uncomfortable and you stay there anyway because I don't know why. Uh, habit, uh, fear, or whatever it is, but when you mo remove yourself from it, and like you take that step, which sometimes is very, you know, it's difficult to take that first step, yep. you do feel a weight come off your shoulders. Absolutely. You do. You know, I know with me, the phone's always ringing, I'm always getting a message, you know, and if I'm not doing that, I I'm a very like, uh, uh, I wouldn't say so much detail oriented, but I'm, I'm 
I'll do things a lot, you know. I, I like I get I get wrapped up. I get ton, some tunnel vision, and I'll be checking Facebook, and I'll look at Instagram, and I go, "What am I doing? I'm why?" And I put it down. Sometimes I'll even delete the apps off my phone for a while. Yeah. And Pete, I get so much peace because I'm able to focus on what I really want to do. Well, not just that. I mean, you have to allow your mind, your conscious mind, and your attention to quiet itself in order for insights to bubble up from mm -hmm. your unconscious mind, right? Mm -hmm. all, all that information that you're pouring in there, there's an intelligence behind all of that that will speak to you. Yeah. But you have to allow it to speak to you. So right. if you keep yourself busy and distracted and your attention jumping from one thing to the other, that insight will never bubble up. You've never given it time to speak to you. You've never quieted your mind enough to hear this voice saying, what about this? Yeah. Why don't we do this? Yeah. You're drowning it out because people don't like to sit with their thoughts. It, it's just, they just don't like to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they actually did a study where they put people in this quiet room with nothing to do. And they said, you have to sit here just in this chair with your thoughts. And they said, and you can do that or, and then they had a little machine that you could shock yourself. <laughs> And they said, or you can shock yourself. Yeah. Most people prefer to shock themselves because of the noise in their head yeah. that they don't have control over. Yeah. And that's what people are doing with Facebook, with you know, the internet, with little games. They can't take the voices in their head. They don't know how to deal with it. They've not, never learned what those voices are and how to control them. Mm -hmm. So they divert their attention by doing this or by being busy. Mm -hmm. and, busy, right. right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself now. You know, I, I, last time I talked to you, you had written the book, uh, Business of Belief. Right. But you do a lot of things. You don't just uh, write books, right? You, you, know, you do some speaking. You do some help with people with branding. Um, tell us more about yourself. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah. So the Business of Belief, that was uh, probably five years ago when I wrote that. Yeah. And I'm still teaching organizations, entrepreneurs, how people form beliefs and make decisions. So people really don't understand this at all. Mm -hmm. And that's why they get puzzled by things that they see happening in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I don't even understand that. Why would anyone want to, you know, book a room in somebody's house instead of a hotel? Yeah. Or somebody pick you up in their car and drive you around? They don't get it because mm -hmm. they don't understand the environment, what people desire, and how they create beliefs. Mm -hmm. They think it's about information, and it's really not. Human beings don't use a lot of information to make decisions. They use their emotions and their perceptions. So I'm still teaching that. But while I'm doing that, I had this crazy idea for a movie. And I know nothing about the movie industry, nothing about writing screenplays, nothing. And I went into this adventure with a co-writer, a uh, good friend of mine, and we, um, while we wrote this screenplay for this movie, a bunch of philosophy started pouring out of it. What we realized while we were writing this was that most people live like scripted characters mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a movie, mm -hmm. and they don't know it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they can't get out of this role, because all the characters around them are keeping them in their roles. And uh, so we, uh, we wrote a little book about the philosophies from the movie, and then turned the screenplay into a novel, and that just got released a month ago, and that's starting to really take off. So it's just, um, I don't know, I'm being pushed and pulled by different feelings and I'm going that way. Screenplay, when you say you had no experience, yeah, you mean none? none. Like none. none, you didn't take a class in school ever or anything, right? No. Nothing, okay. No, zero. So, so you're just like, screenplay is, a, is something I think I want to do. No, yeah, so right. look, basically it's, hey, I feel like this means something, uh -huh. let's go do it. Mm -hmm. And then step into it. And it was, no, it was uncomfortable. I mean, I, I hired a consultant. I tried to write it. Uh, I realized that it was nothing like writing a book. I had written yeah. six books prior to writing the screenplay. Yeah. And a screenplay is not a book at all. It's a visual description of what a director sees frame by frame on a screen. Yeah. I can't see visual images in my mind. I have yeah. some kind of block as far as that goes. So I, I'm trying to write this thing, and I can't because I can't see in my mind what would be on a screen. Yeah. And then I found someone to help me with that, who can't, she can see these images, and we collaborated. And believe, look, it took a couple of years. This was not an easy process. It was a struggle. It was, uh, I quit a few times yeah, okay, doing yeah. it. But 
pushing through all that, despite the feelings that I had of what brought all these insights about living life and it's just a weird, weird experience. The philosophy, where did that come from? Did that come from you and your co-writer? Did it come from people you were interviewing? You said a lot of philosophy came out of it. I was kind of intrigued by that comment. Like where did it come from? No, it came from the process. Just the process? Yeah, yeah. the process was such, a, such an interesting process. I'll give you an example. We had a character, one of the main characters in the movie. And we're writing about this guy, his backstory, who he is, why he's like this, all of this information. And he's speaking to us now. We're, we're getting to know this guy. Mm -hmm. And we're, I don't know where we are, middle of the movie or something. We're trying to create some intrigue based on this formula of how movies work. And my co-writer Shannon says, well, we should have this character, his name's Phil. Let's have Phil do this. And I had like a visceral negative reaction to that because I said, Phil would never do that. Yeah. No, yeah, right? I get it, yeah. yeah. All right. Do you know how weird that was? I stepped back out of myself and I said, this guy doesn't even exist. What do I mean Phil wouldn't do that? Yeah. So as hard as it was for us to write this behavior for this character who we thought couldn't do something like that, imagine in real life how hard it is for people to create a behavior change when the people around them are saying, no, Matt would never do that. How can yeah. Matt do that? Yeah. It's a subconscious thing. So that was like one of the big ahas philosophically about why people, organizations, families, why they can't change yeah. is because they think they're serious characters in yeah. these roles and they have to remain consistent and yeah. coherent. Yeah. And it's, and look, everybody's struggling with this change thing because the environment's changing yeah. so dramatically. That's why they're stuck. Yeah. They just feel that they can't do it. You know what's funny is I went to Niagara Falls when I was seven. I went again when I was 37, and then went again last week. And I was, one of the things I took from it, when I went the second time, I remembered what I remembered from when I was seven, and they had changed a lot. And I expected that. It was 30 years. Right. When again, 13 years later, I couldn't believe again how much it had changed. The environment around Niagara Falls, not Niagara Falls, that's right. always consistent. It had changed. Like the way they did things, the fact that everybody had their camera out and they were all doing this and, and this and, you know, and I'm like, I can't, when I came last time, people had cameras, all right? But you'd take 10 shots and you'd be done. Right. Everybody takes a picture every two seconds and the, everyone's texting and sending pictures. I mean, I was guilty of it too. It was something you needed to experience, not try and capture on your phone. But I was just taken back by how fast things had changed. Yep. Just the way the bus system worked had changed dramatically. And I was like, man, it almost frightened me a little bit, <laughs> you know, because I was like, what's happening around us, you know? So, yeah, the, the change in life is happening whether you like it or not and whether you're ready or not. It's always happening. Look, even Niagara Falls is changing. It's just changing too slow for you to see it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's changing, too. That's what people miss about the marketplace, is, is, especially, is how dynamic it is, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's shaking people to their core because mm -hmm. they, they have this feeling. And, and again, I teach this with people about brand. Yep. Uh, oh, a brand, this is a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it a great brand. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm getting. It's consistent. Yeah. No, not in an environment that's shifting and changing all the time. You have to shift and change all the time, yeah. right? You can't be um, Van Gogh with this one particular style. You have to be Picasso with this changing style over time. Yeah. You know, your essence is still coming to life, but the style is changing all the time. That makes people really nervous. You know, it's funny. As you look at like brands, like brands that have been around since you and I were kids, like Old Spice. When we were kids, Old Spice commercials were about the sailor and he'd the slap it on his, yeah. yeah. And now it's about making jokes and almost making, making fun of the product almost is right. what it's about now. Same with Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's like a, we're going to make a big joke about it, but we want you to buy our product. And it's, it's kind of bizarre. It went from one thing to something completely different. But yet, hey, those are products that have been around for 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. Look, the reason it's happening is because the, per the curtain has been pulled back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Toto has pulled the curtain back. Yeah, yeah. 
We know that this, you know, the wizard is a little guy that came from a balloon from Kansas. Yeah. So he can either make fun of himself, he can still put on the big show. Yeah. But we know it now. So don't be so serious about this because we're not going to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. You had better not take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a good evolution, but it's creating a lot of problems for people who believe, who are really serious and mm -hmm. why don't people understand that we're better and, you know, we're giving them all the information. How come they don't get it? You know? Nobody cares about information, do they? No, not at all. No. <laughs> they, they care about information when they need to defend their decisions to themselves and to other people. Yeah. That's when they say, hey, that's a great bike. You know, how much was it? Well, it was $12,000 for this bicycle. And then they'll say, it's made from titanium, you know, aircraft. That's when they need the information. Because then it's not getting them anywhere any quicker than these other bikes. Yeah. Right? So they have to have the information to defend that, that purchase that they make. Do you have a $12,000 bike? No, I don't have okay, right. I don't think I was my car is $12,000. <laughs> I was wondering if you had to have that conversation with somebody. No, I've heard, <laughs> but I've heard it plenty of times. I've heard it. So where did you start from? Where did this all start from? Like when, when you were uh, getting out of high school and college, did you, was this your plan? No, there's no plan. Look, <laughs> I don't even, I was in college to be an artist. Yeah. Until my father asked me how I was going to pay this bills back. You know, I, yeah. And I said, oh, God. So I went to economics, which was more abstract than being an artist, frankly. Nobody, my, my college professor said, if you can teach a parrot to say supply and demand, you have an economist. That's it. <laughs> yep. So you know, I left there with an economics degree, and then uh, I became a professional magician. My first, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, my, my first few years out of college, that's what I was doing. Left there and went to work for, a, for GE, bought one of their companies out with a bunch of other investors. Yeah. Left there, founded a medical device company, ran that for a while, left there, wrote a book, yeah. started speaking, left that, started consulting, and then mm -hmm. wrote another. Whatever is pulling me in the environment that seems interesting, that I find meaningful, my guess is other people are going to find it meaningful, so I just go do it. And if yeah. it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. I don't but, know. That's kind of a crazy way to live, huh? It is kind of, <laughs> it, it sounds crazy, but you know, it, 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 as I get older, it, it, that sounds like made perfect sense to me. Because as I get older, I realize like some of the things I thought I wanted or I was doing, I wasn't doing because I really wanted it. I did it because I thought I should or I thought, That's it. you know, I started a whole business that I've run for 20 years because somebody told me, you can make a lot of money at this, all right? And I was like, really? Let me try it, all right? Hardest thing I ever did in my life, yep. you know? And it was a really difficult skill to learn, but I learned it because I wanted that money. And then I did it, and I got the money, and I was like, what did I do that for, you know? And it was almost like, you know, boy, you got to be careful what you get good at, you know? In a sense, you know, you got to be careful what you get good at because you can... Pigeonhole. No, I don't know if you pigeonhole yourself. You can get yourself kind of to a point. Well, I, I need to do this. No, no. You're, yeah. Listen, that that is probably the most important thing you can do when you when you're getting ready to make a decision. And and my co-writer, she tells me this all the time, is what is the ultimate goal that you're looking for, mm -hmm. not the interim goal. So if you say, well, my ultimate goal is um, love, you know, is uh, having shelter and food and friends and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So now back up and ask yourself, do I want to spend X amount of years getting this money because I think this money is going to get me love and this and that? Or is there something I'd rather be doing because that's your life. That thing that you're doing in yeah. the interim is your life. Yeah. And we get confused because mm -hmm. we think, oh, when I get the money, then I'll have what? And, and you ask people, what? What do you think you'll have then? Freedom. Usually that's what comes out of everyone's life. Mm -hmm. I'll have the freedom to do what I want to do. And what is that? And why can't you do that now? Mm -hmm. What is it that you want to do? And usually they'll make something up. I want to travel the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know yeah. what? My daughter traveled the world when she got out of college. She had no money. Yeah. She figured it out. Yeah. She had friends, you know, right. she borrowed some money. She traveled the world. Mm -hmm. So it's an illusion that what we want is out there someplace, and I have to do all the stuff I don't like 
to get there. Yeah. Because then you look back at your life and you say, how was your life? I don't know. I spent all my time doing stuff I didn't like. Yeah. It's backwards. It is backwards. And, you know, I think about that. I guess when you're, when you're 25, you figure, I know I'm going to die. You're going to figure it out, right? Yeah. Well, you, but, but with life, you're like, 25, I'll probably live uh, another 75 yeah, years. Yeah, you don't even think, if you think yeah, about it, Yeah, but right? probably forever, really, right. is what you really think. Exactly. I'm probably forever. I'm not going to die. You know, but then you get around 40 and something, you're like, hmm, you know what? According to statistics, I'm half done. And you start going, whoa, wait a minute, you know, did I do everything I wanted to do? And you start kind of right. having some different thoughts, you know. When I was like 23, I met this guy. I used to sell cookies, Stelladoro cookies, to supermarkets and markets. And I went into this little market in Mattapan Square. And Mattapan Square in the 80s was, oh, no. was, was not a place where... You, you know, should be wandering around Right, you go, did your business, and you got out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there were these two old guys that had been there since the 40s. Uh, Santos Burrito Brothers, all right? And they had like a bunch of people that had been coming in that store since they were kids. Right. And this one guy comes in, and he's, at the time he seemed old, but he was probably my age, right? And he was telling me, he worked for the, the, the city of Boston. He was like in the park and recs. And he was telling me that in three years, I'm going to finally get my car. I'm going to get my Mark 8. I can't wait. I've been waiting. I've been saving up. And I remember looking at him going, that's great. And then I felt like really sad, like for myself and for him. Because I was like, that was like his goal. And there's nothing wrong with it. But to me, it just seemed like it wasn't really very worthwhile <laughs> to have waited. And that was your goal, you know? And I was thinking the other day, I was like, I wonder if he got that car. You know, he's probably dead now because that was like 30 years ago. And I just thought about like, what kind of goals do you set for yourselves or what kind of like things are you reaching for? And there's nothing wrong with reaching for a car by any means, you know. Well, like as long as you don't take any of it seriously, right? Mm -hmm. Because you get that car and then what? Oh, damn, it's a boat. Yeah. Right. Or whatever it is. So looking to find happiness and fulfillment and joy through the external world that's a fool's errand yeah i mean if you want it go do it yeah if it'll yeah. if you know if you get a little kick out of it mm -hmm. don't think that that's what's going to bring you contentment yeah you'll never be content chasing things because no. every time you get it you want something else yeah you know that's the trick of that the most fulfillment i ever had in my life was having kids and i did not want to have kids at all and every time my wife got pregnant i would be like oh you know, and this was after I had a kid. I had one kid. The, the second and third time, I got more and more upset. And then my wife makes fun of me, and she's like, what is, what's wrong with you? You know, the guy who didn't want to have kids, you, you're so dedicated to your kids, you know? But I was like, it was, I never had any idea that I would get that much fulfillment. Ah, this is a lesson. You know, see what that lesson is? If you had felt prior to having children, and you had this feeling, mm-hmm, you wouldn't have done it if you could have chosen not to. Because yeah. your feelings would have said, you're, you're comfortable. Mm. This yeah. is going to create some uncertainty. Oh, yeah. We don't know what this is going to bring. Let's not do it. You didn't have a choice because she said, I'm pregnant. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so what you did is stepped into this uncertainty, even though you felt uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be the best thing you've ever done. Yeah. That's a, that's a metaphor for life. When you get this feeling... I don't want to go do this Matt Lagor show, drive all the way down there, mm -hmm. right? You tell yourself it's an experience, it's new, it's uncertain. Go do it. That's what brings you new insights. You don't get experiences by reading books. Yeah. You get them by living through mm -hmm. whatever the experience is. Yeah. So if you feel it and you feel uncomfortable, that's when it's telling you, go do it. Do right. it. I don't want to give a speech. Go do it. Mm -hmm. Go feel it. I don't want to do comedy. You, you, try it. See what happens. I'd say I feel that way at least three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. No, but you know what? There's a part of like growing up the way I grew up, very like a negative environment and like you can't, it's not possible. Why would you want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. You know, that was kind of drilled into me as a kid, you know, and it, it, that kind of programming is hard to get up. It, and it's just, it's not impossible to get out. It's difficult to get out unless you recognize it. Like if I, I'll, I'll say when I start feeling like, oh, I don't want to do that. I go, well, wait a minute. Why don't I want to do it? Um, I don't really have a good reason. I just don't want to do it because I'm feeling uncomfortable. Right. And, and, and so I say, well, there's no real like evidence that this isn't going to be good. Yeah. You see, uh, you can catch, you're catching those thoughts, right? Most people don't catch those thoughts. 
or they think that they can change their feelings through the, some thinking process, yeah. right? That's why we go to psychotherapy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We'll sit on a couch, we'll talk to somebody, the feelings will change. They're not going to change. You'll mm -hmm. be going forever. You've got to move into that experience despite the feeling, and the experience will change the yeah. way you think and feel. Yeah. Not your head. Mm -hmm. You know, this thing is a vicious circle up there. You go yeah. around and around. You'll never get out of there. If you take the experience, I, I can't remember who said it. Someone once said that, that uh, action will lead to insights far more often than an insight will lead to action. I think I said that. Maybe that was that, it was you. Yeah, that's it right. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't exactly. I paraphrased <laughs> it. So. No, but that's, I mean, living life means exactly that. New experiences. Not the same experience over and over again, and then putting thoughts in your head about life. That's not, but we confuse the thoughts in our heads with, with life. Yeah. That's why we're hooked yeah. on drama on TV. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want the real drama. We want the safe drama. So we'll just watch Netflix, and we think we're living. It's an illusion. It's, it's hypnosis. And with Netflix, boy, you can get wrapped into that. Everything. They got two hundred shows you can watch that are You'll all excellent. You'll never leave the You'll couch. You'll never leave. No. no, you know, it's almost like sometimes you have to put the brakes on that. My wife was like, "Hey, there's a new show I heard about," <laughs> and I was like, first I was like, "Oh, what is it?" And then I was like, "I don't know. I don't know if I can commit to this." I, the emotion. I get too emotionally involved in these shows. <laughs> and with Netflix, you can watch every single one of them, and by the time it's over, you're an emotional wreck. I know. You know, I watch Breaking Bad all episodes in like two and a half weeks. Yep. I was depressed for like two days <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One, it was an emotional show. And two, I was like, well, now what do I do? I don't even know what to do now. I don't know what show to take on. I know. The good news is it was safe though. <laughs> See, it's safe. Yeah, it was, that was safe. safe. It was very and safe. And that's what we want. we want. We want to feel desperately as human beings. We want emotion. We want that range, but we want to stay safe at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and that's what TV allows us to do. Yeah. Instead of going out into the world mm -hmm. and getting that range of emotions, mm -hmm. because we're nervous, what will happen? Will we be safe? Will we we'll be okay? Will we, will we end up, oh, I want to start this new thing, you know, this new business. Uh, will I lose everything? You know, will I live in a box? That's what my daughter, my youngest daughter, she, she said, how's it going with the, with the screenplay? And I said, eh, it hasn't been made into a movie yet, but we're still working with some Hollywood people. And she says, that's okay, Dad. And I said, yeah, but you know, it's the whole financial thing. And she says, don't worry, I'll never let you live in a box. And if you really think about it, you're never going to live in a box. No. So what are we really worried about? <laughs> Why aren't we experiencing what we want to experience? One time I was at this this uh, place I did some business. It was, a, it was a really nice car wash. And I was in there and this guy came in and he was a mess. He just was like a real mess, like obviously an alcoholic. And he was like, can I get a drink of water? And we gave him a drink of water. He's like, can you call me a taxi cab? And he looked bad, like unshaven and a black guy. He was dirty and everything. And I was like, what happened to you? And he wouldn't answer me. And then he's like, can you just call me a cab? And I was like, sure, I'll call you a cab. And he goes, but just make sure it's not Royal Cab. And I was like, okay, obviously you had a problem with Royal Cab. So we got him a cab and he left. And I looked at my friend and I go, oh man, I, I just, that's my worst fear that I'll end up like that. And he looked at me and he goes, why would you end up like that? And I go, I don't know, because that doesn't really make any sense that I would end up like that. This is what but I mean. yet I really had like a feeling like, oh God, I hope I don't end up like that. No, isn't that the, listen, here's the crazy thing. So you have that fear, right? Mm -hmm. That I hope I don't end up like that. Now I want you to know, listen to how crazy that is. Do you know how you're going to end up? No. See, I do. Oh, tell me, how are you going to end up? Same. I want to hear. I'm going to end up the same as you. Dead? Dead. <laughs> Food for worms. Yep. Hold on a second. But we don't ever think about that. Yeah. We don't really ever think about how we're really going to end up. Right? Yeah, Because if know. we did, what the hell would stop us from living? Yeah. Wow. That's, that, I have that thought, you know, from time to time. I do really think about it. I go, it's not going to last forever. You know? <laughs> no. And it, it, it can be, if you dwell on it, it can be like very frightening. Just oh, I think, it's, I think it's totally relieving. Do you? Oh, man. If you, every day, if you wake up and you say, I'm dead soon, and everybody around that I know, we're all dead soon, what a relief. Because now, what the hell can scare you? 
See, Steve Jobs, <laughs> Steve Jobs tried to tell everybody that before he died. Mm -hmm. He said, once you realize you're going to die, what the hell are you worried about? Mm -hmm. What? What people are going to say about you? I don't know about you, but everybody that I know that has died, we talk about them for a few months and then we never talk about them again. Yeah, you're right. Right? I mean, the, the show goes on. Mm -hmm. So what are we so afraid of? Why aren't we doing the things that are driving us that we want to do? What is the worst thing that's going to happen? And like you said, you looked at that guy in the cab and you said, that's the worst thing that's going to happen. It's not true. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the headstone in the cemetery. Yeah. That's the worst thing, and that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a powerful insight. And I, you know what? I really appreciate that because I, I got a new perspective on it. And it's funny. I talk to people here on the show, and they'll, they'll have a perspective on something that I'm negative. That was very positive. I yeah, love that. I don't that. see it as negative. Yeah, I want to take, I'm going to take that one on. I'm, I'm going to take that. Take it. Yeah, Look, I, I, got a, I bought a little Halloween skull, this white skull I saw in a the, the little convenience store at Halloween, $4. Yeah. I bought it, and I have it sitting across my desk, and I wrote under its nose, soon. <laughs> Every time I worry about doing something, I turn and look at that thing looking at me, and he's saying, soon, what are you worried about? And I start realizing, yeah, what am I really worried about? What is it? You know, now my 10-year-old daughter would see that and go, is Halloween soon? Because yeah, I can't yeah, wait. Halloween's going to be great. Or well, other people would say that's morbid. <laughs> it's not morbid. It's empowering. Yeah. Because if you've got nothing to lose. I love it, Tom. Good. I love it. Tom, thank you for being my guest. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, what's, if, if someone wanted to email you, could they email you? Could they send you a message if they like the show? Yeah, they, okay? oh, just they just think the message and I'll think the I'll, message I'll, and you'll get it I'll all right receive it. Or, you know or just go online and, and punch in tom asacker and you'll see all the crazy stuff and and we, your book i am keats i am keats the novel which is we we did everything backwards usually you write a novel and somebody reads it and turns it into a screenplay for a mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm. we wrote the screenplay for the movie and turned it into a novel so everybody that's reading it says oh my god i can't wait to see this as a movie is that, so that's what's happening with that. And, uh, yeah, and, then, and then there's another book by the same title, by the way, I Am Keats, with a different subtitle. It's not a novel. It's all of the philosophies that spilled out of writing that movie. And they told us you shouldn't have a, a book with the same title. And I said, we can do anything we want to do, right? Because we're all going to die soon anyway. So. Soon. Soon. <laughs> soon. All right, Tom, thank you. Thanks thank you very much. All right, thanks for watching The Matt Lagore Show. You can see my show on Facebook. Uh, I should say YouTube, The Matt Lagore Show. And I also have a Facebook page, The Matt Lagore Show on Facebook. Uh, thank you to my guest, Tom Asacker. Check out IamKeats.com. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next show.